Hi, I'm Ant Millet. I'm a global partner at Antler. Um, we're a global venture firm. Uh, to be rather confusing, I'm from London. I live in Sydney, but spend half my year in the US. Um, just very quickly, a little bit about Antler. It's really weaving together a lot of themes that we've heard from Armin and others of amazing talent being everywhere and the need to unlock that talent with uh, essentially being able to put a create a platform and environment for the very best of those people to build globally impactful organizations, companies. And so 20 years ago, if you wanted to have invested in venture, um, you'd have been really contrarian to not just kind of put your money with a Silicon Valley VC, knowing that at some point in time, all the, the world's best entrepreneurs would go there. One, because they were the ones who understood how to underwrite that risk. But two, it was almost seen as a badge of honor of, if I get money from a Silicon Valley VC, then I've made it, or I'm going to make it. The world has totally changed now, where uh, you've got capital has become global. We've seen amazing technologies emerging quicker and quicker and quicker. Cloud computing probably being one of the most impactful technologies that we've seen over the last couple of decades. That means that we've created an environment where the world's most talented people can build globally impactful companies from wherever they are in the world. That's nothing new. We've been talking about that here. And so what Antler really does to put that into action is go and find these exceptional people around the world. We're finding these people, uh, first-time entrepreneurs, second, third-time entrepreneurs, just as they're about to start their business. We're pulling them out of university research departments. We're pulling them out of the unicorns of yesterday and tomorrow. We're pulling them out of management consultancies, out of industry. And we bring these people together before they've incorporated their company, help them find, build really strong co-founding teams, validate the best of their ideas, and then we invest in them as a first investor and go on that journey with them, currently investing through to Series C. Uh, just to put it into numbers, uh, last year we had 80,000 people apply to build a business with us. Uh, we brought 2,500 of them into our offices in groups of 50 to 100 where we spent three months with them and then ended up creating about 380 new companies last year. And this year on track to create over 500 companies, which has in five years made us uh, the world's most active um, early stage investor. To Mark's question, do you want me to answer that now or do you want Richard to introduce himself quickly? Why don't you, Richard, you introduce yourself? We're in danger of massively agreeing on a whole number of topics, but I think there'll be... It'll be quite boring then, wait for everyone. No, 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 don't worry. We won't we'll, let that We'll happen. find some stuff to disagree on. Yeah. Uh, Richard Blakesley, as I explained before, CEO of Capital Pilot, we've got a slightly different angle on how we foment more investment in early stage businesses, and that's by creating data-driven systems that enable signal to exist between investees and investors. So we built a rating system Think Experian, think Moody's, that enables startups initially to benchmark themselves against a standard of what investable means. And by um, natural consequence, enabling investors to identify those businesses which are most likely to be investable and to be successful over time. Now, the, one of the key things about this is that businesses don't necessarily know from day one how, what it means to be investable, what they need to do to build a great business. So either you've got a, a venture builder model on the, on the Antlers side of things, or if you're the go it alone type, you need some benchmark, some help, some assistance to enable you to find your place and to be your best self in front of investors. And that's what our rating and our associated assessment uh, model is meant to achieve. So there's this really interesting concept, discouragement, which we haven't talked about much here. And there's a piece of, inf uh, of, of um, research that was done by Aston University into ethnic minority entrepreneurs, not just high growth entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs across the board. And what it demonstrated was that a very significant percentage of ethnic minority entrepreneurs were discouraged from proceeding with their businesses. And they estimated that if discouragement could be excluded, four times more businesses, four times the GVA would be created by that community. And we see exactly the same thing happening across the high growth startup world. 
And it's partly because, quite significantly because, actually the existing VC systems create bottlenecks between capital allocators and those that need them. And that is our target for addressing this issue about how we build more companies forward. We have a third panelist. I needed a big picture person who, who runs around the world investing in funds and companies. And Jeannie is a, a plus a spiritual cousin of 361 already. Uh, just maybe your perspective, as you, as you see today, you, you heard Armin uh, talk about how things are changing so quickly and cycles are changing. And I introduced you to an Indian fund and you're like, oh, I've already invested in four or five Indian funds. It's like you're, you're moving around the world. How do you see both asset classes and the parts of the world to invest in today? What, what are your motivations? What's what your, your thinking pattern? So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, you know, I live in Silicon Valley. Right. It's a tough question for a Silicon Valley person to say, I will invest now 80% uh, in the world and not so much in Silicon Valley. So a lot of investment happened in Silicon Valley of our investments because of Silicon Valley, it's growing still fast, and because of AI right now. So we invest a lot in AI, and uh, which we think the future is huge there, and in Silicon Valley. But it's interesting, uh, we are seeing many unicorns happening in the world in different area, in different places. Uh, for example, we have investment in uh, Norway, which uh, country ten, uh, like 10 years ago or 20 years ago uh, didn't exist in a way uh, like economically so high like now because of the gas and petrol but also because of so many interesting companies happening there. Or in uh, England, we have some funds in England. England is growing really well. They have the highest unicorn almost here in Europe. And uh, we invest, too, in places like Germany. Uh, Germany is growing, but the problem what we see, you know, when you invest, you want to, your return of, uh, on investment. And uh, often, you don't see return on investment uh, in places like UK or Europe or India or other places just because one thing is happening, which is ha it happened a lot in in Silicon Valley is the marketing. So even if a company is not so good, in Silicon Valley they make it so good, they promise, as he said, the truth, the post-truth <laughs> so badly <laughs> that they have a great exit, those companies. And companies like in places like India or Europe or uh, we had also Ukraine and uh, other places, uh, those places, they don't have great marketing. They have great companies. They have great technologies. They don't have great exit. So we end up investing, but we don't have huge returns like in uh, those places, uh, like Silicon Valley. So I still hope that we can teach other places how to make uh, some unicorn and how to make big exit and to learn this concept instead of just uh, not thinking like they think. Fair enough. Now, Simon arrived five seconds ago and I asked him to come up on a panel. So we're just doing, introduce yourself, but where, how do you think of... Simon and I are friends and we just saw each other here today. You we go. are well, friends. Well, you met at World Economic Forum, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. So just... That was one of the places. So you have, you have Antler, and Richard's got his in early stage uh, investment platform and an algorithm, but just how do you see the world today? Oh, you met Miss Armin Sarkisian, who just talked about how the world's topsy turvy and. All right. So, uh, good afternoon. Actually, Mark told me that there are not enough chairs for me in the audience, so he told me that I have to sit here. <laughs> um, my name I, is Simon. If you guys Brian. need a joke at any time, I asked, right. I asked Simon for a joke, and right. he gave me five by WhatsApp. He's, right, right, he's right. good with that. Right. So, um, basically, Simon Vine, for the past five years, I've been investing in um, startups, mostly uh, at the earlier stages. Uh, recently, I pivoted. I started investing in the assets of the companies which are going through Chapter 11, also late-stage companies, 
can talk about that. Um, I see the world uh, pretty much like Julie described. Um, I did try to do arbitrage uh, globally, invested in a few funds, thinking that if the, if the companies are good, they will end up in the United States. And if they're in the United States, the multiple will go up. And therefore, I would invest in better companies uh, for their stage in uh, other parts of the world. And that's exactly what I, s I saw, very difficult to scale uh, to scale up in the United States, even if the products are good, but the founders are there. Uh, so effectively, uh, open business in every country is a different type of business, and uh, very few startups know how to do it and have time to do it. So I didn't find it to be uh, productive for myself. That said, I didn't invest in companies uh, throughout Europe and even Asia. Um, my perception is uh, that the United States, uh, because of the geopolitical reasons, the United States is becoming uh, even more desirable than before. And within the United States, we have emerging markets. I see more and more uh, funds which are focusing on non um, uh, non-Silicon Valley companies believing that they can uh, scale up in the United States and they're still cheap and definitely underfunded and therefore you can uh, basically come up with very good ideas how to collaborate with those companies. We're in the UK, uh, so back to the original question. How, so you may or may not know Andler because you just sat down, and Todd Rupert was here, you know Todd. Because um, you, you have seed funds all, all over the world. Is there, what do you think of the UK? And, and, but is there a particular pr country profile that, of an entrepreneur uh, that, that might stand out to you? Or is it just sort of more ubiquitous, it's more trait-based than, than cultural-based? So I think there's a couple of answers to this. I think to be successful in venture, you can't invest in the average of everything that's going on. To be successful in venture, you need to find that top one, two percent. And you know, whilst we're, whilst we're building 500 companies a year, that's really not that many relative to what's going on around the world. And so the ability to try and find that top one, two percent is, is a very small part of the population. And you know, we operate in areas where we believe there is sufficient density of population of exceptional talent. Now, where is this exceptional talent coming from? And now is a particular exci particularly exciting time because if you look at the history of how ecosystems have evolved, it's really been, you know, when you create one success story, the people that were not the founders of that success, success story that may go on to build other unicorns, but kind of the next hundred people that were part of that amazing growth story, a lot of them will spin out and go and build their own. And you can link it back to kind of PayPal and the PayPal mafia and out of that coming LinkedIn and Open Door and Tesla and SpaceX, et cetera. And it goes on and on. If you look in uh, South America, you know, a company called Rappi, uh, which is their big e-commerce play, has kind of kicked off three, 400 new companies. In Southeast Asia, Lazada has had 450 new companies built by its alumni. In uh, the Middle East, you've got Kareem, over 100 companies built there. And you're seeing here in this country the alumni of um, the revolutes of this world and all of the big success stories that have happened have happened here. So to give Mark a totally unsatisfactory answer, we're seeing a very, very significant uh, talent pool here that have been part of journeys before, whether they were the founders and had maybe a 50, 100 million dollar exit and now want to go and build their next business and create a bigger outcome, or first time entrepreneurs who have got a taste of that success and now want to back themselves. Um, so in the UK, we think it's an incredibly exciting environment. Uh, we had our, a big conference last week where we had British, British patient capital there, a part of the British Business Bank, talking about how they, you know, going even deeper into trying to support companies. They're well aware of the funding gaps that we were talking about. Um, and then what I would say is that just because of the talent base within the UK, the fact that the UK is, you know, up there in so many different industries as leaders or just, that, you know, world leaders or thereabouts, uh, we're seeing the UK being very, very, you know, companies being built in all kinds of sectors. So, Richard, maybe you could touch on how your 
you can answer the same question, but you're, you're enabling it, what, um, trying to bridge gaps, right? And part of the gap is information and understanding, of the, and, and you've got a solution to that. Correct. I mean, I think f funding gap, um, I think companies at every stage would probably tell you that there's a funding, a funding gap at their stage. Right, because it always feels like that. And the reality is that each VC will uh, see 3,000 companies a year and they'll invest in 10. Uh, and we know because of the maths, which is core to our system, as opposed to the judgment system which permeates the VC world, that actually 12% of the 40,000 companies that are created as high growth businesses in the UK each year are capable of being invested. And yet, the number that actually do receive investment is a tiny percentage of that. So I think one of the key things is about how do we build the base, the base of the pyramid. So that's a really, really important thing. Imagine what that would look like in terms of the socioeconomic impact on our economies if we could fix that small problem. Because that's where the jobs are, that's where growth is, and that's where social mobility is. So that's one key challenge. And if you've got the base layer right, how amazing to be able to build the next layers on top of that and create additional funds beyond it. So what we're trying to do is to identify mathematically those businesses which are investable and ensure through the fund models that we're now creating that those businesses which are investable automatically qualify for funding so that you can build that base layer at pre-seed and seed stage to enable the whole pyramid to perform because at the moment actually we've got an inverted pyramid because you're getting more deals, more number of deals actually, and certainly more value of deals happening at the private equity level than you do at seed stage and that just seems totally wrong. Fair enough, let's open it up before we, uh, just in terms of asset classes, I didn't really get a regional discussion. I thought those, Simon basically said, I've been around the world but I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna double down on the US. You said there's a lot of talent in the UK, but you didn't answer like where the, your best markets are. And Jeannie's basically saying Silicon Valley is gonna win my, my money because it's, it's sort of like what you, what you know. Actually, I in, we invested in many places. So we invested uh, as LP in VC firms in, uh, in Europe, in India, in Asia, in the Europe and Germany, in Norway, in England, different places. So we learn a lot from our investment and we invested not now this year or last year, like 15 years ago, we invested in many VC firms in those areas and we got some exits. So we know like which market is doing well and um, still, uh, still Silicon Valley is a place where it's important Don't worry, to I'm gonna invite everybody up here soon. Hi. Colette just came in off, off her planes. Welcome. Yeah. Finish, Hello, everyone. Fi finish your thoughts. Sorry, Jeannie. Yeah, so nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, so, uh, when you see a pretty girl, you are like little, but you, ch you cannot focus <laughs> again. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, only only, so only another that, pretty girl can say that, though. So, so yeah, so. I don't think Silicon Valley is the place. I mean, as he said, what, what is interesting, you ha there are now AI where you can find which company is investable, which company is, can be, do a big return. And in those companies, we should invest. And right now, I just spoke today with some, a company, fantastic company we invested in, it's an AI company, and they are not getting VC firms. They are not getting investors because everybody is worried. So this company might, uh, go out of cash, even if they are like great team, great company. So we have to focus on this area where we make sure that great companies get funded so that they can grow and, uh, and do a better return and get more, yeah. hire more people and it's very good for the... De definitely a theme, you gotta get to the next round. Yeah. But back on global allocation, maybe Colette, you can introduce yourself. Sure. We're, so we're sort of merging these two panels. You're part of that? All right. Um, so we're t just give me a, if you could, global perspective, because you've been around the, you know, as you, what, how do you think of country risk or country opportunities today? And I'm so sorry I'm, you didn't meet, you're, getting, you're brand new under this, because we've been talking about these themes all day. It's working, hello. Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, nice to be here. 
My name is Colette Young. I uh, am the Chief Investment Officer of a single family office based out of Puerto Rico. Uh, we're predominantly in tech, um, but we, we do everything across government RFPs, um, infrastructure, debt, just kind of the whole spectrum, real estate, uh, early stage investors, uh, to later stage growth investors as well. So um, across the stack, across different uh, verticals, across different industries, across different uh, locations, so we're all over the place. I guess the question that you're asking is how we are differentiating ourselves in terms of where we're going, or? What, how do you, where do you want to be? Do you want to be in the U.S. primarily? Do you want to be? Well, we're, we're Americans, so, I mean, the U.S. is the largest market, right? Um, so I was actually, I apologize for being late. I was at a gala last night for, um, for tennis with a bunch of Goldman Sachs partners and country heads. So it was a lot of the guys that were running uh, emerging markets at the bank. So it was interesting to see their perspective versus ours. Um, you know, well, that's why I'm saying it. You know, they're, they're focused primarily on emerging markets, which are kind of getting wrecked right now. But we're very much US centric, predominantly because it's the largest market in the world for us and what we do. Um, I think a lot of technology per se develops elsewhere, but to grow it, it really still is from the United States. Uh, what we have seen is a shift from San Francisco. Um, so, you know, a lot of tech is now becoming, you know, the center foremost in, in New York and Miami, which is really interesting to see. Um, I was in technology and venture early in 2010, and nobody was really doing venture back then in New York. It was very, you know, everything was out of the valley. So. It's really interesting to see the tra transition happen now. Um, and then from a, from a global marketplace, I mean, we are still tied to Asia in a lot of ways, but we're doing more activities in the Middle East. Um, I just think that they're kind of ahead on their, their game in terms of innovation. Um, some of the stuff out of the ADGM or the DIFC is really interesting. I know Qatar's doing some stuff. Um, they funded an AI company that I was speaking with last night at this gala I was at and uh, for a very large ticket. So I, I think that if you're looking at, you know, geography-wise, um, I'm less of an investor in the UK, um, just prominently probably because I don't cover it as much and, you know, as much as I love to live here. Maybe it's part of, <laughs> another theme that we've talked about, part is like people invest in their circles, particularly at the early stage. That's why women aren't being funded. You know, just because they, yeah. they're not in the circles. Well, we're, we're lucky because um, we come from this industry. So our friends are the people that start and create markets, right? So it's what's, what's lucky for us is we get really, really good deal flow. We don't act like a traditional family office, though. So I say this with a, with a grain of salt for everyone else that runs a family office because we're very different in terms of our allocation. We do a lot of direct investing. We do a lot of direct investing because we can. Um, we get access to a lot of deal flow that most people wouldn't. So we do pre-seed, seed, seed um, across the stack. We typically structure the deal, cut the deal, lead the round, um, and then it sets up the stage for all of the other folks that come in later on. Uh, we also do a lot of incubation because we go very deep into verticals that we're interested in. You know, and right now we're really interested in the geopolitical shifts that are happening. I heard someone say that earlier um, when I was walking in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, from that perspective, really interested in debt, hard money lending, government RFPs, food and water security. Um, you know, AI is a buzzword right now, but you know, we've been investing in it for 13 years, so it's, it's, not, it's not new to us by any means. Uh, and I'm specifically interested in self-sovereign identity. Wait, wait, what's the last one? Self-sovereign Self identity. Where we all become our own sovereigns? Yeah, so um, oh. I think there's a, a problem that's happened. So I particularly like bridges between old to new. That's what I built my career on. It's what I invest in. It's what I'm most interested in and passionate about. Because I think that the world is shifting very, very quickly. And uh, all of the different pieces that are going into place um, are relating to that. So the shift that I'm talking about right now is Web2 owning your data and your privacy. And I don't think that that's fair. So I like the shift that's currently being had, which is basically a shift to saying, well, you should own your own data and your own identity. How do you do that? You know, there's KYC AML that, um, you know, 
everyone uses in one sense or another. You get your passport, you get your license, you give your social security number. Why is it that the, that the agency or the business is making money off of you and owning your data? Why aren't you owning it? Because you're letting them. Because you're letting them, because you did from Web2. So there's a company that we funded called Self ID, um, and we are the pre-seed investor in it. We just raised the seed round uh, that was seven and a half million. Really, really interesting. Um, the guys that started it created the largest stable coin in the world, which is, you know, at its peak was an $83 billion market cap called Tether. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about it because I think it's going to change a lot of things. Well, you're sort of moving into the emerging industry. So well, let's keep on this panel. Let's t talk about the industries. Pick one industry vertical, each of you, that you're excited about. Who wants to go first? You, you just did. Who's next? I'm happy. I'm happy. Okay. Just at a high level, I mean, I think, um, as Colette was saying, you know, being at the forefront of company formation, we tend to see things three, four, five years before they hit the mainstream and I wouldn't have called generative AI generative AI before everyone else did, but we have a lot of stuff that looks like generative AI and now we've got a really good label for it and obviously it's having its moment, it's having its wave and you know, we're focused on exits rather than high fives of funding rounds. Um, but I think the thing that I'm probably most excited about is the advancements that we're seeing in healthcare, in the industry and also within our portfolio um, and with genomics and the overlays of AI and other technologies, the ability to kind of get down to really bespoke treatments for people and treating people as individuals at costs that are um, that are appro appropriate and, um, and and palatable. I think that's an area that we're we're already seeing huge advancements. I don't think we've seen the the Chat GPT equivalent come out, so everyone starts going, "This is the next wave," and I don't know if it will be the next wave or there'll be a wave before that. But this stuff going on, on in the background, we're seeing lots of it all around the world. It's uh, incredibly exciting and impactful. So we're going to switch places because we have only have five chairs. Obviously, you didn't like what emerging, I said. The emerging industries is going to sort of morph over here. And, here's an, and I know what you're going to talk about, which is space. That's your industry. So talk about space for a second. Why should we be investing in space? Actually, we were talking about that too, Colette. Very nice switch we just had, so thank you. Um, Pleasure to meet everyone here. Um, why space? Uh, launch costs have come down dramatically. SpaceX figured out a way to reland a rocket and brought the cost down from what was $20,000 a kilo to send stuff into orbit to what it is today, which is low single digit thousands. You can have real unit economics and a path to profitability in space. And there's a lot of money to be made. Right now, there's two big revenue drivers, satellite communication, which effectively is bypassing the need to build out infrastructure in areas that are very expensive and costly. So instead of building cell towers in developing nations, you can just have connectivity in IT through space satellites. That's about a four to $500 billion market opportunity. And those satellites need launch services. And those launch services are being built by people like that are leaving SpaceX. And then the other big revenue driver is defense. Space assets are part of any defense system or US sovereign arsenal. Um, and there's about 30 million kilograms of mass that just waiting to go into space and we gotta find a way to get it up there, so. Fair enough. Jeannie, do you have a particular, very specific niche that you like? Yeah, so. Uh Everything that is good for humanity. Keep the microphone up right there. Everything that is good for humanity and for our planet Earth and for ocean is, is of interest. For sure, humanity means healthcare and well being. And for sure, healthcare means right now AI research, how to make sure the medicine, cancer research, those areas. Second is also with the humanity, is also like there are stuff like autonomous car, robotics, and uh, and space is something interesting. Satellite is a very interesting area uh, for the future. I am not into going to Mars, so this is something I am like not so much. You don't want to go? No, I'm sending other people, like sending Elon to Musk, but not me. <laughs> so hopefully, <laughs> no, I'm not going to Mars. But uh, like, I'm not interested. 
I'm interested more to how to protect our planet Earth instead of just focusing how to go, like I'm more interested with space, how to protect our planet Earth with satellite, with stuff like that can protect our Earth from other stuff. Uh, dangerous for the earth then interested about our sure about our planet like a climate and area where you can protect our like planting agriculture and ocean protection those things are also of interest and in those area they are sure the AI area and robotics that can help and support so those are area I think I like to invest in and I think it's important that we invest in to, to for us it's not for someone else it's Perfect. just for us. Perfect. Now you're going to pass your microphone to Amir. And move. And move. <laughs> <laughs> and thank nice, you. Nice to see you yours? from New York, remember? Oh, New York. Tech stars. So he is yeah. like a boss in New York, and I had one Berlin yesterday, so it's like. There you go. <laughs> That's the way we roll. Yeah. All right, Amir. So t t tech stars, but you're doing something really interesting for them. Uh, the sort of tech, yeah, right. tech stars 3.0. I took the photo, remember? Of the yeah. view. You're welcome. I'm at Techstars. My background's in machine learning, reinforcement learning, complex systems modeling, value creation. I joined Techstars to build out their fun follow-on strategy, alternative data strategy, and uh, use value creation insights to signal what's going on. I'd mention that you know, there is an entity called Conception X in the UK that does work with all the universities and does do all this dealing. Uh, they've been around for several years. They started from UCL, and now they work with all the universities. They're not a fund. And I'd also say that a lot of the screening processes that you hear people talking about embed a lot of the biases that turn companies in the UK, in my opinion, and this is not an opinion of tech stars, into bolt-ons, into acquisitions, and limit the potential for them because they turn into opportunities for larger acquirers to expand and capture markets. Uh, I think uh, Samoir Brothers in Germany is a wonderful example of taking and building entities and markets that are hard to enter and then selling them off to eBay and Amazon, a lot of these people that want to be there. Great R&D country, but a lot of the unicorns like DeepMind were R&D acquisitions. So you don't have the same sort of uh, markets as US. Plus the network centrality of investor fund flows still centralizes on Silicon Valley. If you look at DPIs, you look at top quartile DPIs, a lot of the big deals, a lot of the money being made is still coming from Silicon Valley. In the last year, Tier one investor signals, which run a lot of VC funds and what they do later on, they're gone. A lot of the tier one investors have paused and a lot of the Tiger and SoftBank activity that spiked valuations created a lot of froth. People don't know what to do. And secondary markets are going up. Pro rata as a service is becoming a big deal. But a lot of this has ruptured the sort of signaling which has directed a lot of venture, which is, is there a tier one investor? So I, I, I just, a little intro on me and my perspective. What yeah, was no, the question? The other part, because this is supposed to be an industry panel, but, but we're rolling with this. What is the, the signaling and, the, and if tech stars can't figure it out and optimize it, you know, and Antler's creating a follow-on fund, like all these groups are doing it, we're trying to figure out how to collaborate. You're trying to also automate this into some, you know, so that there's scoring, there's objectivity, which in the public markets exists to some extent. So I would say that, you know, we did do 600 investments last year and we were the largest investor in pre-seed. You could look at all the accounting on that. It was the largest. We'll talk about that. I'll talk about the according, according to uh, Crunchbase and PitchBook, uh, you know, in terms of they sort of, aside from that, I would just say that, you know, if you look at power law strategy, which dictates a lot of this sort of strategy, and you look at Kelly betting, you look at bet sizing, a lot of these companies that are coming in early, like Techstars, have very small ticket sizes. We're, like Antler, we're globally distributed. We have a lot of corporate partners. We announced the eBay accelerator. We're the premium service for accelerator structures. We do very well. But I just say that the strategy is dictated by the ability to handle a globally diversified portfolio. We haven't had a real presence in Silicon Valley until, until last year. So f until last year, although we've had, you know, I think great performance, we are kind of the anti-portfolio to Silicon Valley until last year. And this is the thing that's very interesting. You know, you have that centrality of Silicon Valley, you have interest in the type of companies, but if the companies are not venture backable, if they're not gonna have that growth, they're just acquisitions, they're just bolt-ons. And in many cases, those power law failures 
they're not necessarily failures, they're not the massive returners, but you know, 70% is what you assume in the power law. And most calculators on portfolio performance, they, they stop at 80 deals. They say do 80 deals in your fund and you're gonna have a high likelihood of a winner. But the reality is if you go much more than that, you have these sort of bounds that start rising above zero in terms of Monte Carlo simulations and the simulated performance. You know this, we talked about this. You were saying this, kind of insinuating that, and I believe that as well. I think the power law strategy is really a great strategy for this. But then if you look later, after power law entry, you do the, the J curve three to seven years later, most of those are either failed or acquired, and now you've got a subset that's highly vulnerable to market shifts, market swings. That's where the global diversification really plays in. Then it's a question of how do you support them and get them to be unicorns, then it's growth and all this kind of you know, discussion that we've been having. Introduced us to Chris Hales back, uh, back in the day. Go yes. blue. <laughs> Thank you. So I will talk not about an industry, but the segment, which I think is a white um, segment for now, a white, white space. This is something I mentioned, uh, buying, uh, assets, uh, buying the assets of the companies out of um, Chapter 11, right? So what I discovered is that uh, however difficult it is to find to fund companies now in general, there are pretty much no people, no interest in, in buying the assets of these companies, which sounds a little bit strange to me because some of these companies um, went through m many rounds of investments. They have product m products with product market fit. Uh, they're cheaper than early stage companies. Uh, and nobody wants to invest in them at all, at any price. And I'm not talking about millions of dollars, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and um, I think that there is a wave of these companies and it is caused by, number one, the problems with funding, and number two, by the fact that many funds uh, need to get rid of their weak um, uh, portfolio companies and they're happy to just give them away. Um, so that's something which I think is happening not only here, uh, with one of my uh, friends, we looked at the company at which he, in which he uh, was offering me to invest at $300 million. Uh, he and his partners bought it for 400,000 uh, pounds two weeks ago. Uh, and basically, it is a very well-known uh, FinTech name, but uh, Basically, nobody wants to invest in them. And this, by the way, a UK company. Well, there's no institutional. The institutions won't do that. That they're, they don't want that risk, right? That's definitely a so of basically a what maverick happens like is you. That, right. The institutions will not do it. Uh, private equity firms will not do it because these companies have uh, cash, uh, cash negative. VCs will not do it because they don't buy assets. They buy companies then uh, a regular financial investor cannot do it because um, he or she needs uh, some kind of management expertise and management transition and needs to understand bankruptcy. So suddenly it becomes on the buy and sale side, a very limited pool of people who can, who can do it. So, but anyway, many of you do distress that. I think it gives you an idea how to invest in distressed assets and uh, I invite you to look at the space. So, Richard. Do you have a, does your data tell you that there's a particular industry that's exciting? Not specifically. I mean, I suppose my answer to the question would be a highly self-serving one, which is to say that the thing that we're most focused on is venture tech. In other words, bringing technology into the venture space to clear out some of the inefficiencies and biases that mean that it is such a bottleneck in the process. So. Let's move away from the self-serving. Um, the, 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 the data of the portfolios that we've created, and we've been running a model portfolio since 2018, uh, have uh, extraordinary diversification. And that's diversification not only on sector. Uh, don't get me started, by the way, on how we define sectors, because that's an absolute minefield. Uh, there are so many words that we've generated over the last few years to describe sectors, and it's mostly nonsense. 
but also those portfolios that we've built by objectively measuring the companies that belong in those portfolios shows enormous diversification in terms of region within the UK, gender in terms of the founders, and also ethnic minority. So what we're creating, what we're trying to create is the, the broadest possible diversified portfolios that provide that equality of opportunity to all. So you mentioned venture tech, which made me think of Janelle. So you're going to pass the microphone to Janelle. She has a venture tech platform of sorts focused Thanks. on IP. Actually, we talked about how we are maybe synergistic in a way. Of course. Um, obviously, intellectual property or the patent assets, other forms of assets, data, it's important in every industry. A lot of the space tech is data as well. Um, one of the things that we are trying to do with our patent forecast software is to give more visibility into these leading indicators. Patent investment always leads the market activity. It's just the requirements, the patent law. So why aren't more funds and investors looking at IP as an indicator of where to invest? It's obviously a because great... Because you make it easier. They don't know you. Uh, Explain how you make it easier. Okay, uh, recovered engineer, first of all, but I brought that into patent law. I'm a patent attorney of 24 years, but as I started practicing, I found it was very difficult at that time in the late 90s to have access to patent data. It's free, the government provides it, every government provides it, but at that time in the US, you had to physically go to the US Patent Office. And in the very late 90s, it was made free online, but very difficult to search. So it used to be charging for data very expensive, and then search and data became free, but it's too tedious, right? How many of you have read a patent? Almost nobody, because it's boring, right? It's, it's difficult to understand, and there's a lot of noise. 95% of patent assets bring no monetization, no return. Why? Because they're developed without a strategy. Right, so most venture we see looking at IP assets, they tend to check the box, do you have it, do you not have it? Spin outs from universities, I'm sorry, a lot of them are low quality because it's low cost driven and the numbers are how many did you file, how many did you get? And it's not about a continuation practice to set up for the company. So we, did, we do a deep dive so you don't have to, uh, but we find that it's very helpful. We've begun using the data to advise funds quick SWAT, is this a thumbs up, thumbs down, and then go into it very stage gate. You don't have to have a valuation, a clearance opinion at the beginning. You can wade into it as the investment is looking good and then turn that data into strategy for the companies you invest in. So I'd love to talk more about what you're doing at Antler um, because you can actually position the IP portfolio to be attractive for partners, customers, vendors, and for exit. Look, a lot of the major acquisitions that Google has made, for example, they go into the market later and they have to acquire patent assets. Motorola Mobility, look at their acquisition of um, uh, in the wearables space as well, right? A lot of that driven by patent, uh, patents and patent data. It's also a good way to find the talent that you need. Expertise in a given area, that's all in patent data who are the most innovative. Where is it happening in the world? Where to locate? Where to put your R&D center? You know, can you do a deep dive for that, this subject for us? Help me lead, it, lead one. I think it's, that we should do that. Sure, I mean, one, one of the things maybe to talk about is even let's pick an area like space tech, right? We know that there's a lot happening there, but if you look at it more broadly, it's not just what's happening orbit, orbitally, but what about suborbital? That can be a lot more granular data that's helpful for the Earth, right? That is making introduction, I think, for you later. A uh, company that we're looking at out of Silicon Valley, Solaris Suborbital, they are doing um, solar-powered gliders that can maintain their position. And so data used to prevent forest fires or deal with them, looking at climate, looking at deforestation, et cetera. That's, a, that's an interesting complement to just thinking traditionally launching out. And then, of course, across a sector like space, it's a little more complicated. You have to build the craft. So composite data, composites. Um, we look at investment in each of these areas, what's needed, um, you know, where are the gaps and how to fill it, right? Stimulating the creation of these assets that are valuable to a company and an industry instead of just filing patents. Don't just check the box. Go deeper. What else are you looking for there? 
No, no. That you've, you've and valuation. You know, we're talking a lot about uh, uh, assets that ha have become distressed but may be very valuable. You have to know who that's for. We talked about this on one of the calls. This, we're seeing a great growth in the U.S. for credit, private credit, secured only by the patent assets. And so what we're finding there is that there's a, a different shift in how the valuation is made. You can't look at traditional approaches for valuation of IP in that situation. You have to look at liquidity value. If you only have that asset and now you have to sell it, what is it worth then? And with the more granular data, it's actually a roadmap for approaching those companies more likely to buy it. But it's important to make that distinction as well. There's, it's kind of wild west right now for patent asset valuation in the U.S. It's not being done consistently. Yeah. I can. Uh, as, for that. As some, yeah, as somebody who is going through this process, I have to tell you that I'm very actually surprised with the situation with IP. I will give you the numbers. So the company which we bought uh, spent three hundred million dollars on um, development patents. Uh, we did a new valuation of the portfolio and it came at uh, $23 million. And uh, the most valuable um, uh, patent is worth $13 million out of them. We cannot make anything out of it. And we're trying to sell it for $200,000 and nobody buys. So it gives you an idea that um, you really need the expertise like Jinan offers to understand what pa these patents mean because everybody is asking about IP, as she said. And then it turns out that most of this IP is absolutely useless. You really need to understand uh, what you're paying for. I think just uh, as a preserver between both of you guys saying, um, I, I, I came from the family office world before I was a space investor. And I, I know that family offices have the ability to be super nimble and take advantages of opportunities like this because you're in an environment where everything seems to be changing, you don't know where to place your dollars, and then to the right of me seems like a great opportunity to find distress, and to the left of me seems like a great opportunity going after patent assets. I think family offices are just extremely well positioned in this environment to be able to act nimbly and go after opportunities that traditional large institutional investors will just move way too slow, and by the time they get there, the opportunity is probably gone because the family offices and these very niche funds and investors can step in and take advantage of this seemingly opportunity that might be maybe a year or two years now. So it sounds like it would be helpful have a package that really lets you make that decision quickly, um, a la Richard's point, right? Um, well, to keep the trains on time, because we could keep on, keep on rolling microphones, uh, but I need to do a wholesale switch of this panel to, the, <laughs> to, the op, to the, how we optimize impact and philanthropy. But if you want to say a last word, Colette, I don't think I can stop you. You're welcome to stop me if you'd like. Uh, no, the only thing I would say is I agree with that. So, like, uh, last week I had 23 closings in a day, um, which was aggressive. My teams are working around the clock. But it's because we've been seeing the fact that a lot of people are not having uh, the liquidity to move quickly. And like you guys were referencing, a lot of companies that are good companies are dying. So the question is, is who do you save and what value do you, what value can you ascribe as a, as a family office that can write a sizable ticket into something that could potentially shift an industry? So. I, I have a last word then before I get off the stage with the Thank microphone. You. One is to look at the big, the big problem. The big problem here, I've heard it before, liquidity, right? So how do you find solution to that? Well, we've seen companies that are sort of making a move into that area. The NASDAQ secondaries market's always been there, right? It's all manual. Uh, I'll pitch one uh, company that's in, not pitch, I will mention one company that is the Research Triangle area in North Carolina, who is called Equity Shift, that is doing automated secondaries, creating liquidity so that early stage investors can move out and move on to other things when they need it. I think that's an interesting thing. We've mapped that area and it's kind of an inter interesting sector. In community are doing that. Last, just, last word. Yeah, I just want to respond quickly to the whole Mars thing, um, and it will tie into the next panel of impact. We have people who want to go to Mars, though. Well, I, I just think that there's sort of two schools of thought in space, and one gets a lot of attention, which is Elon that wants to put people on Mars. But I think the other one is sort of O'Neillian or Bezos, which is Earth should be zoned light and residential, and space should be zoned heavy and industrial. And as launch costs come down dramatically, 
anything that has a high carbon footprint should be done off earth. And I think that the ESG community has not realized that space acts as an important infrastructure for them to be able to do what they want and already acts as a key infrastructure for data collection that basically informs their ability to push so you just, impact. You just set up the impact panel, didn't you? There we go. Thank, thank you. Come join our 361 firm community of investors and thought leaders. We have a lot of events created by the community as we collaborate on investments and philanthropic interests. Join us.